but uh, it's my great honor to be here today with Ham and Lamb, General Ham and <laughs> General Lamb. Um, bring your own skewer for shish kebab. And <laughs> sorry, I couldn't resist. I mean, it's, it's got to be, yeah, it's got to be done. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I had to. It's, it's actually the only reason we were invited. She had, she <laughs> had to find two old generals yeah, who names ri <laughs> whose names rhymed. Yeah, that's. Right. Um, I apologize. That's all I got. We're done. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I apologize. General Ham, um, we were just talking about, is one of, I think, few four stars, uh, prior enlisted four stars. He um, joined the Army in 1976, I believe. 73. 73, sorry. Yeah. He's even older than I thought. But thank, he doesn't look a that. day older than 1976 commissioning, <laughs> or, sorry, entry. Um, and has had a an extremely distinguished career with service in um, all kinds of fun places, most recently um, as the commander of U.S. Africa Command, but um, also as the commander of U.S. Army Europe and uh, Division Command in Iraq and um, lots of other uh, assignments. I, I was fortunate to get to know General Ham when he was the J3 on the Joint Staff and ran Joint Military Operations. Um, so a job I think that probably made his future ones seem manageable at least, if not <laughs> tame, in some respects. Um, so General, it's great to have you here. And General Lamb uh, is, I don't know where to start, He's um, he's yep. been everywhere and done everything and some of it he can talk about and um, also commanded at multiple levels most, uh, is, uh, commanded the UK Special Forces, was um, yeah, has been deployed everywhere that you can think of, and in particular a lot of nasty places. He was um, probably became best known to American audiences when he was the uh, deputy commanding general in, for multinational forces in Iraq and was in charge of the reconciliation effort. Um, and then uh, has developed deep friendships with many of our senior commanders, and uh, so is a is a is a personal manifestation of the special relationship, I think, that um, we all value and treasure. So it's, again, great to have you both here. I really appreciate it. I've asked them to talk for a few minutes about a couple of things, some lessons, their lessons learned from the last 10 years and uh, 10, 12 years and whether or not we've actually been learning them and then sort of their outlook for the challenges that ground forces uh, may be most likely to face in the coming years. And then uh, we'll get into a conversation uh, with all of you, and we look forward to the afternoon. Thanks. Good. Well, thanks, Maren. It, it, uh, there's really two reasons that, that, that I'm here. One is when, when Maren calls and says we want you to do this, the only acceptable answer is yes, ma'am. You know, so you come, you come and do that. The second reason, which is actually more compelling, is that this gave me an excuse to leave a household uh, full of moving boxes. Uh, we're, we're in, our, in the, the relocation process, so this is, uh, much, this is far preferable to, to unpacking dishware. This is, this is true. Um, but I think that the, the topic uh, today to, to talk about the appropriate role of land power and the future role of, of land power, it's, it's timely and, and certainly an important topic. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, uh, the, uh, the, the air-sea battle proponents and others probably have been more effective uh, in conveying uh, the, the imperatives for um, uh, operations in space, air, cyberspace, and maritime domains uh, than have been those responsible for operating in the, uh, in, in the, the land domain. And so I think today is an opportunity to to have a, a dialogue about that and see where we, where we want to go. But I think in general, uh, my view is that the, the land power domain, the land domain conversation and narrative has not been as compelling perhaps as, as, as others uh, who advocate for operations in other domains. But I think for, for those of us that, that uh, spent most of our, our life uh, in, the land, in the land domain, it is an important topic, and, a, and I think, again, a timely one. Um, as I look at it, in my, in my view, that, you know, conflict and, and security uh, are inherently human endeavors, 
and humans live on land for the, for the most part. Uh, and, and so I think there's a, a, a linkage between operations in, in the land domain and operations in the human domain. Uh, and the intersection there, I think, is, is compelling and one that we need to really think about. Um, I think the senior leadership uh, of the, the forces that generally operate on land, Chief of Staff of the Army, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, and the Commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, I think have, have come to that, that same sense. And I think, as many of you know, they have, the three of them have recently issued a white paper and they have established a, 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 a task force or organized principally from those from the Army, the Marine Corps, and the Special Operations Command to to take a look at what is the appropriate role and, uh, and responsibility and what are the capabilities that the nation requires uh, of its land forces for the, uh, for the future. Um, again, I think many of you, you know, part, it starts with you know, understanding what do they mean when they say strategic land power and of course the definition is the application of land power toward achieving overarching national or multinational security objectives. And I and I think that that's I think that's good, um, but what I what I am a little bit concerned about as a as a as a, as a retired officer is that it, it almost seems that the 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 proponents for air sea battle and the proponents for strategic land power uh, they're 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 perhaps competing uh, narratives, and I don't think that that's necessarily where we ought to be. It's understandable to me that that may be how this is unfolding, particularly in a resource-constrained environment that we, that we find ourselves. And, and so we have this ongoing debate about allocation of resources. Again, understandable, but I'm not sure that that's exactly what's in the best interest of the, of the nation. What we really do need, I think, is, a, is a, a very thoughtful, comprehensive review of what are the, what, are, what is it that the nation expects of its military forces uh, General Dempsey has talked about this a, a number of times. Uh, and then we need a healthy debate about how do you build the, the kind of force that operates in all domains across the range of military operations uh, at, uh, at affordable cost given the environment in which we, we find ourselves. So the fiscal reality certainly will shape, uh, shape some of this. Um, lastly, I think that the, the strategic environment um, the the uh, operational realities and the, the current fiscal uh, constraints will mean that we will almost, we the U.S., will almost always uh, conduct land operations, probably all operations, but specifically land operation in concert with others. And so I think that gives a particular emphasis uh, to, uh, to the, the uh, Army, Marine Corps, and Special Operations Forces who operate on land, in human terrain, how do we work most effectively with allies, partners, uh, friends, uh, and, and others as we look uh, to the future. And I think this has got to be uh, a very key consideration as we build the land force uh, for the future. So with that, I look forward to the discussion, Mara, and, uh, and questions from you. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot for that, sir. Uh, Joan Lamb. Yeah, the, um, I was going to be over here in the United States for another reason. And that was going to pay for my ticket. <laughs> yeah, when it we fell, ske originally scheduled this. It <laughs> fell by the wayside. So I've had to haul myself across from the United Kingdom to here. Just because I, just because I, ma I made a promise, which uh, I wasn't about to break. So uh, I flew in last night, and I'll fly out tonight. But <laughs> it's a real, yeah, it shows you how powerful Marin sort of, you know, pull, pull here. <laughs> the um, uh, two borrowed thoughts which I'll throw you away, which I sense need to be just held as we go through this session. Um, the first is Francis Bacon. Uh, he was a philosopher, a statesman, and a scientist. You know, he was famous for the inductive reasoning, the idea of a bottom-up logic to looking at a problem. You know, you, um, uh, he said things alter for the worse spontaneously if they are not altered for the better designedly. Do nothing, and you're going to go into a very bad place. And the second is Charles Darwin, who made it very clear 
that it's not the strongest of the species that survives, it's not the most intelligent that survives, it is the one that is most adaptable to change. And of course, we represent from our previous lives, and we're looking into a space that sits in a context with the other services here, who are institutionally, historically often fixed on what was and what they grew up with. And yet I sense the changes in this troubled century um, are exponential. Difficult to even put a margin on how some of those outcomes could be. So there's two just sort of drawn to give you a thought. I have four lessons, you might say. Now lessons, I think none of them are new. The reality is all forgotten uh, and brutally reminded over the last 10 years. You know, the most misused word, words in the English language are lessons learned because they just aren't. And we should, and myself and Carl would understand this only too well, you know, we should be so much better than this shit, but we're not. <laughs> you know, we've been doing it for 300, you know, for 300 years, for, for centuries. And yet, in effect, we keep on coming across these same sort of issues, and we should be better. The first really is drawn from uh, Carl Philipp von Gottfried von Clausewitz, yeah? a rather dull German <laughs> who wrote eight almost unintelligible books on war. Um, uh, uh, you know, as an aside, he talked about you know conflict being just a human intercourse. This idea of this you know, battle of wills, this constant arrangement of people between peoples, not between equipment. Uh, but he's almost best known for war as a continuation of politics by other means. My sense is that he never finished the sentence, which is to politics. Therefore, it must return. We, the military. You know, we can deal with the cause, the case that we're presented with, but we can very seldom, if ever, other than a very small tactical event like a strike operation against a very specific target, we cannot deal with the underlying cause. You know, our injunction into events here is often at best at the operational, if not grand tactical level. We talk about strategy, but the truth is we sit within a far greater network, a far greater head, headroom. And when we talk about whole of government, which is how the British talk about this sort of what I call comprehensive approach to whole of government, you know, what I have found over the last 10 years is I tend to drop the W, and it tends mm. to sort of nail the problem. <laughs> so that's my first point, yeah. The second is, um, uh, is this fixation that almost came out of our upbringing in the Cold War, which was situational awareness. We've got to have situational awareness. You know, where's the other guys, in this case, third shock, eighth guards, whatever it might be, in, in the Cold War? Uh, you know, where was his tanks? Uh, how much ammunition did he have in them? What was the fuel states? Da -de -da. Didn't matter when you're air, in effect, on the uh, northern approaches or, or, uh, or, the, or the land battle. And we'd forgotten in the savage wars of peace the realities of these small wars, the space that in fact is very much this troubled century, that it's not situational awareness, it's situational understanding that we should be seeking. And how slow and how bad have we been in trying to close with that particular issue. Albert Einstein's got a fantastic quote, you know, when asked, you've got 60 minutes to save the world, what are you gonna do? And his answer was, I'd spend 55 minutes defining the problem and five minutes finding a solution. My experience over probably most of my, my career, but in particular over the last 12 years, is I come across people spending 59 minutes trying to find a solution, and then the last one minute blaming everyone else. <laughs> so in many ways, you know, we just don't get the situational understanding. And does it matter? Oh, you better believe it. You take something like, for instance, Yugoslavia when it fell to pieces. You know, do we really understand the revenge the anger, the history that sat within single villages which all looked on the face of it to be good friends. And yet they wrapped their neighbors in barbed wire and put them through bandsaws because of an old anger from the 40s and before. And yet we go into these spaces where we don't have, I'm a Brit, the old colonial service or the political officers who would sit there you know, I'm just finishing Con Coughlin's book on uh, uh, Churchill's first war. You know, he's really angry that, you know, the political officer keeps on going out when he as a young officer wants to go and just, you know, kick the shit out of the opposition that are out there. And the guy sitting down and doing a jerga. Oh, sorry, sorry. Who's, who's, 
who's, who's <laughs> out there, and he's stopping the maneuver space, you know, the, the, the conflict of space, because the political officer is understanding, understands the situation at hand. So that's my second point. The third is, if you want to defeat asymmetry, you do it symmetrically. We keep on forgetting this. We keep on trying to apply an asymmetric answer to an asymmetric problem. You want to crush asymmetry. You know, the fellas had to operate against you because he has not got the ability to face you. So he goes through a different method. You must do so symmetrically. So the whole of government, again, re comes back into, into that place. Uh, and the final is that George Bernard Shaw reminded us the world is run not by reasonable, but by unreasonable men. You know, Kipling suggested that every so often you must go out and slay evil. You know, that has not gone away. And so the truth is that while we come into this, and everybody here are good people, our politicians, our foreign office, your state department, are all good people. Yeah? What you mustn't do is be lost in your objectives because you listen to the moderate space. It's the unreasonable man that has brought the military to the battle space. And he or she isn't going away anytime soon. Over to me, that's <laughs> the unreasonable woman. Um, <laughs> thanks very much, both of you. Uh, I wanted to ask a couple of questions to kick this off. Um, General Ham, to, to follow up on a theme that you raised about the, um, the, the narrative of the air-sea battle versus the one for land power. Um, in my opinion, one of the reasons why air-sea battle has found some traction is that people can envision scenarios in which it might be relevant. And one of the challenges for land forces has been creating that same sense of relevance. So for both of you, I'd like your thoughts on where do you see land forces as most relevant in the next decade or so? And then um, is it in a different way than we've thought about them in the past or we traditionally think about them? Uh, what, is that, what does it look like to you in the future? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's one of the real challenges in, this, in the, the narrative of strategic land power is because it isn't clean or precise. And, it, and, it, it, and that, that makes the, the, uh, um, the compelling narrative difficult to build. And I think that you know, one of the challenges that, the, that land forces in the U.S. face is that we do expect land forces to be able to operate with uh, great effectiveness across the, the, the range of military operations. So yes, they do have to be able to, the nation expects that they can uh, go to the Korean Peninsula and defeat the, the, uh, the North Korean army on the field of battle in a, in a, uh, you know, in a very physical sense. There is that expectation. And we should never forget that. But, but they also, as, as, as uh, Graham points out, they also have to be able to operate uh, in the small wars and in the, in the, in the distant spaces um, where it's less physical in, in terms of the physical destruction of an, of an adversary's forces. And it's much more about uh, supporting or uh, uh, compelling um, uh, a population to modify their behavior or accomplish some other goal that is in our in our national strategic interest, and I think that's where the I think that's what what's different to me about this current debate and, and discussion. Uh, it, for most of of my military career, it was mostly about how do we become more tactically effective. What are the technologies, the doctrines, the capabilities, the force structure? What are the things that are needed to make, in my case, the Army more effective as a tactical entity? I think the discussion that, that the Chief of Staff of the Army, Commandant of the Marine Corps, Commander of U.S. Special Operations Command are now uh, fostering is, yes, we, we need to still have that, but it's, but it's bigger than that. It's, it's, it's not, we, we've seen, We've seen the limitations of, uh, of, of uh, the, the physical force, the overwhelming combat power. We've, we have that and we've applied that. 
but yet we haven't achieved, at least not fully achieved, our, our national objectives simply through the application of force. So that we, we've got to think differently, I think, about how do we uh, get populations. And it, as, as Graham Mack correctly points out, the Clausewitzian trinity of the state, the, the military, and the people, you really do have to address all three. And it is, it is uh, um, not sufficient to address only the military component. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, all I would add is that, that it's very easy um, uh, when you feel the sort of fiscal pressure, and I'm a Brit, so we understand, we've been <laughs> feeling the fiscal pressure for a long time. The, um, but when you start feeling the fiscal pressure, that, um, uh, you know, no obvious monolithic threat now, no Russia, no um, France, no Germany for us, no global war on terror, it's more difficult to define that, that, that what happens is people will then drop into the natural defense of their service. You know, mm. armed forces defend the realm. You, your prosperity, and your way of life. And it's really important that actually, in fact, the general officers, the admirals, and, and, and the air marshals, you know, you know, recognize that responsibility. I can't think of any better chairman, you know, in many ways than Marty to be, Marty Dempsey, General Dempsey, to be able to try and pull that debate together. But the money has already forced, I sense, the services into these separated spaces because it's a zero-sum game. Yeah, money's going to get tighter, and that's just an absolute as it sits out there. Um, and they'll, they'll hide those spaces. Now, in what space, how should they operate? Well, you know, the reality is there's 44 million square miles of ocean out there. And a carrier group's a fantastic piece of, you know, just a fantastic organ out there. In a, in a very specific place can bring an enormous amount of power and influence. But if it's in the wrong place, that's a lot of distance you've got to travel in order to get somewhere to try and do something. And what are the something going to look like? Well, there'll be things that require <coughs> air and sea uh, engagement. But, you know, Mexico <coughs> City is 20 million people. Mumbai, 18 million. You know, these are the low figures without going into the slum spaces. You know, there, there is, across the world, just these huge, huge spaces <coughs> of people who are full of very good people, but there's quite a lot of unreasonable men and women in there to boot. And in this century, you know, we've let technology escape. You know, the 14 pages that drifted on the atomic weapon that went out of Pakistan into the hands of others you know, had been protected for a couple of decades. Now the speed with which you can pick up, I don't know, synthetic production, siren, anthrax, you call it what you will, biological, all the sort of spaces that are in there, yeah, you know, just call up the internet. You don't have to go to a library and be tagged because you took the book out, which tells you how to do kitchen explosives. You know, today, actually the NSA is looking at me anyway, they've been reading <laughs> the, the, uh, but, uh, but the answer is, you know, <laughs> you know no, no shit Sherlock, no, of course they have. You know, I'd be a man, a Brit, I'd say, of course they have. You know, and I'd be disappointed if your nation wasn't taking your protection seriously. The, uh, but what you have now is just a few souls can deliver industrial violence. <coughs> that's not casual violence, that's not what I call spectacular violence, that's industrial violence. So take 10,000 into the power of something, and that's the sort of figures you're looking at, and they'll rip your heart out. They'll change your way of life in a heartbeat. Yeah? So the problem is then, oh, allied to that, you've got the power of communications. So the common that matters in this century is not air, land, sea, space. The common of this century is communications. I think it was T.E. Lawrence in the 1920s you know, talked about the power, the, the most powerful weapon the general had at his disposal was communication, the media space that was sitting out there, and that's expanded. I can absolutely capture people's passions and emotions in a heartbeat through my damn Blackberry, through my iPhone, through the internet. Perception becomes reality, and with it, bad things happen, and they will accelerate accordingly. So in many ways, what we've got is a debate that is now being polarized into very small service spaces, yeah, your president, Eisenhower, I think said in the 1950s, you've got a wicked problem, enlarge it. You really do need to enlarge this damn problem. Uh, let me ask another, tie two <coughs> sort of questions together about 
um, our 2012 defense strategy talked about developing innovative new approaches to small footprint uh, operations. And so I wanted to get both of your takes on um, what might some of those things be going forward and, and also what's the special forces role or special operations forces role in that um, and again relatedly what do both of you see as the evolution of SOF and conventional force integration from where we are now? How do we carry that momentum forward? What does that look like? Um, both in a national context for us and in an international context. In, uh, in, in, at U.S. Africa Command, of course, there was specifically designated uh, in the Defense Strategic Guidance for innovative light, you know, low-cost light footprint uh, approaches and that, that that basically said, you, you know, don't go don't 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 come asking us for stuff. You know, <laughs> do go do with uh, what with what Be you innovative. got. innovative. Um, but what I think what I think it means is what we're talking about today is that how do you uh, I instead of being wholly reliant upon upon uh, only the Department of Defense's assets, how do we work cooperatively with other agencies, departments, organizations, not only within the U.S. government but but in host nations and in partner nations as well. Uh, it's, it's something that, that we, uh, I think we intellectually understand, but we haven't yet put it into practice it, it, to the full extent that I think it is necessary. We, we talk about uh, uh, allied and, and partner uh, operations. We talk about building partner capacity, but I don't think we've really uh, institutionalized it, it, it to the degree that that we need to as we look to the future. And what would that institutionalization look like? Well, I, I think it's, uh, uh, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's an approach that says um, it, is in the, it is in the United States' best interest to help others uh, achieve security goals that are important to them, but that are also consistent with our, with our own. So it's not, it's not uh, building partner capacity for building partner capacity's sake. It's targeted, it's, it's operating in areas and, and helping uh, other nations develop the security capabilities that they need to achieve their own security objectives, but security objectives that are, cons that are consistent with our own. Um, uh, U.S. Marine Corps, a few years ago, I remember doing some work with uh, General Wilhelm, Charlie Wilhelm, who's a, just a top dollar. <laughs> Sort of fellow in my book, the uh, you know he can write. You could just, you could just take it down and just then hand it out as a book. You know he's, he's got that sort of accuracy. And whereas my books would always be about this long, and then you have to get out all the sort of the, the swear words that become about <laughs> about this big. The um, uh, but but he 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 was looking to sort. Of, I think it was called distributed warfare, or the idea of in fact you know how to look at small teams, interconnected communications. You know UAVs as hod carriers and the sort of what I call you know bringing ammunition, mm -hmm. taking casualties out, a whole range of things which which in my view was, was thoroughly innovative in, in the sort of thinking of, about how you might want to operate and how you could operate and then bring technology. And then this balance between what the sea and the air space and the space space uh, and communication space can bring to your, to your understanding. You know, you, know, I, you, know, you take, for instance, the moment, you know, the argument that's going on in the United States between Palantir and DCGSA or whatever it's called, yeah? At the end of the day, you think, you know, hey, let somebody else carry the dollar bill while they produce something that's pretty damn good and can be adapted on the space, yeah, but, but that's, that's another argument. The, um, uh, but I think this, the distributed warfare is, is a good piece of thinking. What, you sh what we do need to get across and get over is my experience of defense is you keep on going with the old maxim, equal, you know, shared pain for all. You know, we, may, we, we the Brits, have been making that mistake year on year, decade on decade. If you were running a business and you turn around and said, let's say, you know, it's a body shop, body shop doing really well, let's expand into America, yeah, and then you turn around and say, hey, America's not really working for us, but equal pain for all, you know, they, the receivers would be in within a fortnight. You need to turn around and say, America's not working, cut America. <laughs> Just come back in and go into core stasis, yeah? So in this case, if something's working well, reinforce success, the old maxim from the Russians, don't reinforce failure. And so the idea of taking your money and using it intelligently matters. 
here's an interesting sort of thought piece, which is the problem with great institutions, departments of state, and we're exactly the same. We're a lot smaller, obviously, than something like DOD. You know, what you do is the department manages its responsibilities and budget. When you're in operations, you run the operation as you would do a business. But back here, it's different. No one's running the business. If you were to try and run the business of defense, I reckon people would be, would be taking some very bold, some very innovative, and very forward-looking decisions. They don't. They just manage a given, which is the budget that's coming. And that is what's going to hang you in a heartbeat. I'd absolutely agree the symmetric whole of government approach and the like, the importance of partnership matters hugely. Because if you haven't got the sort of footprint or the force that you're going to put into some of these spaces, you know, all right, let's go downtown Mexico City. The truth of the matter is you do absolutely need to partner with a cultural awareness and people who know what they're talking about. And so the idea of crossing into that cultural space, go back to my point, good old Einstein, it's about situational understanding, not just awareness that underpins this. Actually, the truth is you've got to bring and make those words and give them true meaning. And at the moment, we tend to give it, oh, we want partners to do what we want them to do, rather than a partnership, which is about two equals on the same stage, having a conversation about saying, have we a common, pro a common problem? And so it's not about containment. It's actually about a strategy for all of us, UK, United States, of convergence. But that's not how we currently see this wicked world. Um, one last question about how, uh, how, how this transatlantic relationship ought to evolve before we get to your questions. I think people are out picking up cards. And if you need more, put your hand up and you'll get them. And, um, but as we evolve together and, and, and have many shared interests, um, where there, some people have argued there should be a sort of implicit division of labor where Europe takes more responsibility for North Africa or, and the Middle East and, and we look more uh, to Asia. And is that what we should be doing? Should we make it more explicit? Um, how should we move forward together? Well, it's, it's the old spheres of influence uh, discussion. And, and of course, that's fraught with, with, uh, with danger. If, 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 if we subscribe to that, then others will as well. And we might not like the spheres of influence that they establish. Um, I, I think there is, uh, the, the United States is in a special place. It, is, it has a global leadership role. And that means global is global. Uh, and, 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 and prioritization is, is one thing. And, I, and that's, that makes a lot of sense to me, but but uh, that doesn't mean that we uh, that that we don't uh, operate globally. I think as as is 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 our uh, as, has been our history. We, this special relationship with the UK, I think, is one that that uh, for all the right reasons we 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 selfishly need uh, to to sustain. Uh, and I, I would just uh, cite I've, I've lots of years in Europe and these past couple of years working in Africa. That's, that's not an area where the U.S. military has great depth of experience. And, you know, I was, I was pretty typical, I think, of most military, U.S. military officers uh, serving in Africa, is that with the exception of a small cadre of, of extraordinary foreign area officers and a small number of focused intelligence analysts, most of us are, are novices about Africa. That's not the case uh, in the UK where they have officers who have, and, and, and non-commissioned officers and who have long service here. Uh, Sir David is, is, I mean, he's one of the people that I went to see early on because of his uh, uh, broad experience. So, so selfishly, we want to sustain that, that, uh, that relationship, uh, maintain those ties, uh, and and because our, at least in my opinion, our national interests are so closely aligned that, uh, that most places, I think we're going to find ourselves working shoulder to shoulder. And that's, I think, good for us. Um, I'd, I'd just say that you know, there's a real danger in relying upon too much on Europe mm -hmm. and saying, well, they'll do all these pieces. You know, I went to the first Gulf War, and I remember only too well the Belgiques wouldn't sell us ammunition. 
just because they had taken a political decision, which is entirely right. right They're a right. sovereign government. They can do what they like, yeah, but that they didn't want to lean into this particular space. So we couldn't get 155 ammunition off them. Mm. And you think, hang on a minute, that doesn't make sense. You take the last time we went into Iraq, 2003, you know, Turkey for, again, very clear reasons said, you know, not through our space, mm. even though you say, but they're part of NATO. So, so there's a real danger in, 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 in having a sort of what, a, what would look on paper to be a, you know, Ollie North, you know, a neat idea, you know, neat solution, um, uh, which has all the pieces that just perfectly fit. Well, you can guarantee that you're going to end up with a crossword puzzle that's 500 pieces, yeah, and 250 are not going to be there. Yeah, and uh, you're going to be guessing what the damn picture looks like. So, so that assured support is, in, is, is a difficult one. Now, we the Brits can sit on a sort of back in our laurels a little bit, look across Yarl, you take Libya as a good example, yeah, and, um, uh, and rely upon CENTCOM and the good offices of the United States of America, the administration, the president, DOD, and old friendships to in fact lean into these things, yeah, and provide a whole lot of stuff right. that we just don't, we don't pay for, we can't afford, we don't have in order to sort of round off that, that, that sort of balance. If you start dropping all that stuff, then you're definitely going to have some big pieces that are missing, and, and therefore, you know, that, that sits as a problem. On the UK-US relationship, you know, we made a decision probably back in the 1920s, probably the last grand strategic decision my country has taken, which was we would err towards America rather than Europe in our relationships, and that decision has served my nation extraordinarily well this last, I don't know, 100 years plus. Yeah? Coming into that sort of space. Um, uh, but we need to identify very clearly where we have common interests, where we have common values. And the two are quite different. We have common values, we have common principles, we have a way to look at things, but our common interests yeah, can sometimes come across where the assumption, Vietnam's a good one, where America said, you know, hey, you'll lead in with us. And Churchill said, no. You know, we, we, it is not in our interest to go there. Just as in Suez, you know, you rightly or wrongly, you turn around and say, hey, we're not going to lean into you either. So, so the idea that your special relationship, your, this, this linkage is one that always demands that you're there on every occasion, actually, I think, is misunderstood. The idea that we have common values is the part that really matters, that we have a view about the rights and wrongs about how society should engage, how the Westphalian model of nations should stand up to their responsibilities. That's the stuff that I think genuinely matters. We don't talk about it enough, and we should do some more, but I think that is, in many ways, you know, what, 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 what carries the weight here. But having a clever jigsaw, or a clever model, which just fits all the pieces like an old Meccano set, you know, the, uh, which sees you know, this idea of a sort of great Western or, you know, solution to a fiscal or a public or a political problem uh, would probably be fraught with some serious danger. The Meccano set's going to go nowhere. Okay, let's get to some audience questions. Great. Okay. I'm, I'm going to try to group some of these together so we get to more questions. The, the first one is about interoperability between the U.S. and U.K., and I'll, there are a couple of sub-questions there. You, you've addressed this a little bit, but the type of interoperability we see we saw between the US UK French and other coalition partners during Libya uh, was was on the Air Force side where are we going in terms of trilateral specifically French US UK cooperation in land forces specifically uh, in Africa and to include SOF and the other question is how difficult will it be to achieve uh, US UK land power interoperability with an increasingly rotational model of U.S. Army presence in Europe? Um, I'll, I'll take a, a piece of that. Um, as Marin mentioned, I previously served as the commander of U.S. Army Europe, and, and it was, uh, was a real concern to me that as, as we drew down uh, particularly Army forces and in, uh, in, in, in headquarters structure uh, in Europe, that it would become increasingly difficult to stay connected with our with our NATO allies, in fact, a, 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 a British officer once said to me that he said if you if you take away the Fifth Corps, which which uh, uh, which cased its colors last week, and and no longer have a divisional headquarters in Europe, 
I don't know how we connect with you. So I think that I think that's a real problem uh, for us in, in maintaining. It'll it'll be harder for us to maintain the same kind of relationships that uh, that were frankly were normal to me uh, growing up in the in the army in Europe, where we frequently were were working with uh, not only the the UK but other uh, NATO allies as well. I think what that what that means for us in the future, particularly in the in the area of of leader development, which I think is at least as important, if not more important, than, than technical uh, interoperability. We'll have to make a concerted effort to make sure that, that our leaders who, who heretofore have had, had the opportunity to, to interact with, with the NATO leaders on the other side of the ocean, uh, just as a matter of course through a, a repetitive assignments, we no longer have that. So we're going to have to make sure that that uh, we have some means uh, to make sure our leaders stay connected. On the, on the interoperable piece, within NATO, it's, it's pretty easy. And, and, and obviously, with that, that paid great, uh, great dividends uh, in, in the early stages uh, in, in Libya before it became a NATO operation. And even those non-NATO countries who contributed forces had been trained and designed their systems to, to, to meet a NATO standard, particularly in the air domain. And so that made the interoperability uh, significantly easier. Um, I don't know what that means for the future. You know, you now have multiple uh, sources for military hardware. Uh, and, and that, I think, certainly was a challenge for us in Africa, where even inside a, a single nation's forces, they might have a, a, a varied mix of, of equipment that they that they'd purchased or had been donated by a number of different nations and and that really complicated uh, uh, the efforts to to build a cohesive force the um there is a danger always in in trying to establish um uh, a way forward if you just go on a structural approach it looks very neat and NATO is a, a good one to do it, and it's proved to be extremely resilient and very useful over time. But if I was to turn around and look at the last 10 years, uh, what have been quite extraordinary friendships forged in battle, trust, and that relationship, you know, we are at a completely different level today. And those, that relationship resides in people, not technical hardware, you know, Clausewitz again, you know, the art and the science, the art of people. I, I did some work with General Mattis, again, a, you know, just extraordinary. I just love Jim to bits. <laughs> you just can't help yourself, yeah, at the end of the day, you know. You know, what was it? The uh, be polite, be professional, but have a plan to kill everyone, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. You know the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, he's just an extraordinary, uh, and a hu huge intellect. But I remember doing some work with him for, for, for Chairman Mullen, again an extraordinary chairman, um, you know, uh, which I listened to a guy from, a fellow from MIT who had a head about the size of a planet, yeah, <laughs> but his brain seemed to be about the size of the universe, which I thought, what you all do here in MIT. But after about 30 minutes of, of a bit like listening to Clausewitz or reading Clausewitz, you know, unintelligible, sort of, you know, I, I thought, God, you know, that is absolutely draining. But I think what he's just told me is that the next three to five years is all about innovation and integration. And 2020, 2025 is all about invention and discovery. Now, the assumption is you therefore have to wait to find the, no. What it tells you is you basically look at what you've got and making it work better. Understanding how it's applied in the near space and your slightly distant space is all about a massive investment in people. Because they will come out of left field with something that just takes your heart away and absolutely will take out the heart of an enemy, and you just don't even know where it's at right now. So those relationships in many ways matter. The interesting thing, if you look at special forces, special relationship, the UK and the US, yeah, we go way back. You know, I, I, I remember Charlie Beckwith coming across in the 70s, Bucky Burroughs, I did selection with Bucky Burroughs. The, um, uh, you know, he was just told, go and do selection. You know, the son of a bitch passed it. You know, I've been training for, <laughs> for about a year, you know, really hard, but, but it spoke volumes about a young officer at the age of 23 had a thousand Montanards under arms up in the Highlands as a Green Beret. 
you know, extraordinary. Again, you know, that, that was sort of a relationship. So that relationship is, is a, if you go into Europe, quite interesting. You know, the, the French have a different special forces. You know, in many ways, the special forces in Europe that we, the Brits, can relate nearest to is, is the Norwegians. And that sounds, you know, think, hey, where'd that come from? You know, in many ways, it's just how the structure fits together as is. So, so the idea of, oh, they're SF, so they're all just nodding together, yeah? Raid and all the rest of you are a different combination. The, the way that, in fact, the uh, French political authority, and don't forget, you know, they were drawn and fitted and armed in 1962, 63, to jump in on Paris and remove de Gaulle. Yeah. You know, so, so the French political system has never forgotten that. Now, their officers, their NCOs, and their soldiers are extraordinarily brave and absolutely well up for the fight. But actually understanding the context in which their decision-making takes place, just as, you know, Title 50, Title 10, all the rest, you know, I understand all this stuff with America's side, yeah, and how the Brits do it. Just look at something like, for instance, you know, GCHQ, NSA, the authorities we have, which are really quite extensive, and some of the abilities you have, which are very extensive, but actually your legal ability to use them, again, have been to date restricted. But, um, and so in many ways, I think that bringing this stuff together is a, is it, it, you know, it, it requires a lot of art. And if you try and apply a structural science to it, you'll be disappointed. It'll look great, and it just then won't damn well deliver. If I could make one last right. comment. Martin, you, you <laughs> mentioned that the relationship between land forces, conventional forces, or general purpose forces, and special operating forces, I think that is one of the, uh, the, the, the things that has fundamentally changed in, in our profession over the last 10 years. For, for most of, of my uh, service, growing up on the, on the general purpose force side, there was very little interaction with the special operations forces. Uh, the, the campaigns in, 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 in the Balkans, uh, later in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, have forged a, a much closer relationship between the general purpose forces and special operating forces to the benefit of both and to the benefit of the nation. And that's something that we don't want to lose. So where does that go from here? I mean, um, I, 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 well, I think with the, the, the challenge is, a, it's a, this is a good challenge to have. You know, that, that, that battle was the forcing right. function. Right. Uh, we, 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 conventional forces and special operating forces came to work together because of the pressures on the battlefield. What we have to figure out now is, absent that, how do we preserve in our training and our preparedness and our exercises uh, in, in, the, in, in this, this notion of, of regionally aligned forces, how do we make sure that we sustain that very close and, and beneficial relationship between conventional and special operating forces? Yeah, I, I mean, the, if I look at where our conventional forces, general purpose forces, how they started in 2001 to take this near term of the last 10 years, uh, where they were and where they are today, you know, they, they, they look like the SF five years ago. Mm. You know, their equipment, their methodologies, their uh, approach, their, um, uh, their ability to be able to fill that task. The truth is that, that, you know, to go back to my sort of, you know, contextual one about power of one, about industrial violence, about uncertain world, about nothing comes up the way you're expecting it, about adaptability and all that. You know, the SF space needs to be moving into that new, that up, you might say, you know, take it up another level. Actually, the conventional forces need to be absolutely consolidating where they've been. And here's the problem. No more money. Yeah, your money's fixed. In fact, actually, your money's not only fixed, I sense your money's going to be going south. And in that case, people will defend the big programs because that's what the industrial defense base, again, good old President Eisenhower, but where the industrial defense base, they produce some fantastic equipment. They have absolutely manned up the job, but, you know, every force an equal and opposite, there's a darker side of that which turns around and says, hey, this is what you're going to get rather than what you want because that's what we're producing, these are jobs and all the rest here. So the relationship between them and the Hill matters a great deal as to how, how they run things. What really matters is how you can then pick up the pace for your own ground forces to be able to now consolidate all the stuff they've learned, all the way they've looked at what they were doing in Afghanistan and Iraq, and take them into a new level. 
And then you can start saying, oh, when you look at, therefore, conditions based numbers and this sort of affair, then you can start reviewing numbers. If I look at a thousand man battalion going across the line on the first day of the Somme, and you try and now work out what that looks like in the way of combat power and what I call stretch and reach within the sort of units, then the numbers begin to change dramatically. But you have to make that investment. You have to put the R&D in. You have to look at you know, automated weapon systems, a whole range of stuff that is sitting out there, but you won't have the money because what will die immediately as the cash goes down is your activity levels and your ability, therefore, to have these young men and women, in fact, consolidate that expertise. You will not have the money to put into the R&D, which is the space that you absolutely, America, please do so. Be absolutely leading on that, because everybody else is struggling to find the cash to do it. And you are a technological giant in many spaces, yeah? And then you're going to turn around and say, oh, and then you're not going to have the ability to be allowed to do it, because you'll be told what you need to be buying on the basis of a reduced budget. And you'll lose your brightest and your best, because they'll move on the basis there's no activity and the proposition has now, in effect, degraded from one which has enjoyed the last ye 10 years of supplementals. These are things which I absolutely recognize as a Brit because we've been there. You historically have not, and yet the challenges are just so much larger. But as this enormously important superpower, this world global leader, you know, I just absolutely need you to be doing the right thing. Yeah? And not just, in effect, what I call following a rather, and I could almost write the script now as to what is likely to happen. And it's not a great tale. So I've got to sort of blend a few questions here. Um, one of them deals with the active reserve component mix. Um, you know, where do you see that going? Um, and how, how will that, in the long run, affect? Um, the agility and the quickness of the force. Will it? Can we? Can we make sure that we have the forces in the places that we want and need it? Um, and then, sort of shifting, shifting modes. What challenges do you see in um, getting mechanized infantry to train for maneuver warfare as well as coin um, simultaneously? Um, if I may take the the second piece, I just uh, just last week uh, was out at uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. Um, it, it is the home of the. The, uh, the, the brigade that is the Army's regionally aligned force for, for Africa and, and uh, is the 1st Infantry Division and having some close association with the Big Red One, it was nice to be back there and, a little, and, and being present at the birth of the Africa regionally aligned force, it was interesting uh, to talk with them as well. That brigade is a, is a, a heavy brigade, a, a tank Bradley uh, a fighting vehicle brigade, and and they have they have the the dilemma of how do you train that brigade for its conventional mechanized combat force because they they certainly have that they can be called upon tomorrow uh, to go fight someplace uh, if that was necessary, but the chief of staff of the army has also given them the responsibility to say and, and oh by the way. I also want you to be able to deploy in small units with small capabilities, very tailored in support of uh, U.S. Army Africa uh, in their engagements with African land forces uh, across the continent. So it's a tough balance, and the brigade commander is wrestling with that. It's uh, when, it was, when they were standing up the brigade and they focused on their, on their conventional combat mission, that was, that was it's never really easy, but it was it was bounded, it was clear. They, they, you know, they have a cadre of officers and non-commissioned officers who grow up in the, in the Army knowing how to do that. It's familiar territory, and they can do that. Africa, on the other hand, is all new to them. So they, they, they really had to, to, to craft their skills. What the brigade commander is now wrestling with is, you know, he went, they went through a combat training center rotation. They did all the things that are necessary for them to do. Now his challenge is how does he sustain um, a, 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 an adequate level of, of conventional combat capability for a heavy brigade, at the same time he's deploying small units in, in company size and smaller uh, across the continent of Africa. They'll, they'll, they'll figure it out, but they're not going to figure it out top driven. They're going to do it as Graham said. It's going to be the sergeants and the lieutenants and the captains 
this, this, this extraordinarily experienced and, and imaginative and adaptive force that we have, they'll figure out uh, how to do that. As one example, uh, so the brigade commander is saying, hey, the Moroccans have M1 tanks. Why don't we figure out how do we do a tank gunnery with the Moroccans? You know, we're doing, we're doing two things. We're, doing, we're, we're fulfilling our regionally aligned force responsibility and we're simultaneously sustaining our own conventional combat skills. So, the, I mean, these guys are pretty amazing. They'll, they'll find a way, but, but it is not going to be easy to meet both tasks satisfactorily. Uh, I think, you know, my, my part would be the, the idea of a, you know, a, a, a holistic approach to a, to a wicked problem. Um, you know, if you look at Germany in the 1920s, you know, they frameworked their ability to be able to expand from a very small and very restricted because of the rules and regulations that we had laid down upon what they could have by way of equipment and what they could do, but they were able to, in fact, very rapidly fill the space. If I look back and remember my father, you know, when he talked about the, uh, you know, as a young officer, in, he went from Alamein all the way through the war to the Reichsfeld, but, you know, he, he, he was always very clear that, that, that in an odd way, Dunkirk was a necessary sort of event to almost get some of the old guard out of the way and the new mm -hmm. guard in, which then went on to a citizen army go on and, and take a conventional battle to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to Germany. Um, the problem is what we try and do is we keep on trying to do everything with everybody. If you take the special forces and turn around and say, why are your special forces, you know, whether it be Delta or SEAL forces, you know, any one of the other, TF-160, you name it, you know, how are they? You know, for people like me, who's a professional sort of in that field, turn around and just, you know, big respect, you know, not just, not just sort of, you know, oh, superficially, but, you know, I, I've operated with them, you know, and, and, you know, just of an extraordinary talent. Well, what you haven't tried to do is turn around and say, I want you to be conventional, I want you to do this, I want you to do something else. What you said is, I need you to be really, really good at this particular complicated adaptability space here. And so when you turn around, and, and try and, and I hear the argument coming around every so often, I remember it coming through the last 10 years, you know, oh, is it CT or is it COIN? Give it, oh, come on. It's all of the above. It's CT, COIN, and conventional. It's all of that stuff all together, yeah? You don't you somehow, you know, sort of take the old magic dust and sort of what I call, you know, fire the silver bullet and, oh, the CT's gonna solve all your problems at the end of the day. You know, Mr. Drones can just piss off a whole nation in a heartbeat, yeah? And so, but is it a great weapon system? Oh, you better believe it. You know, if you want that sort of accuracy. But, but I think there's a danger that what we're trying to do is we're not just balancing the force. And so the relationship, a new age of thinking between, you know, your guard, as I recall, you know, you put a brigade alongside spaces in the United, in the United States that had a million men and women. You know, it was about just keeping an eye on your own. That was the sort of what I call structural maneuver in the United States. Now, in this case, you turn around and say, actually, how does the reserve fit into the conventional battle. It may be that the reserve and your guard are the conventional forces predominantly. Yeah? That doesn't mean they're going to do it all. And they're not going to do the front end stuff yet, but the truth is, in fact, and then you need to return and say, and therefore, how does the rest of your force fit into other spaces, which are those which, in many ways, you may well find yourself fighting in, rather than what is historically, oh, air, land, sea, you know, the old modeling which comes through. That's not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but actually this debate, in my view, needs to take place. And what you shouldn't do is just assume that what you had before will work for the future. You've got some extraordinarily talented, I mean, just extraordinarily experienced men and women now from the last 10 years who have a perspective. You have a huge base of great thinkers from the Cold War era. era. You know, Frank, all these guys at the end of the day. And so you need to bring them into a space which genuinely begins to look out there and say, you know, what are the challenges that we face? And therefore, what is the force fit to fight? I, I think that's right. In, the, in my view, the reserve component of the U.S. military should not just be a, a, a duplication of what's on, in, the active, in the active force. There's got to be a a thoughtful process that says what capabilities are needed on, on such a short timeline uh, that, that they have to be in the active forces and are there, are there other capabilities that can reside uh, in the reserve components that we can call upon that we have some time 
in order to build those capabilities. There is one specific uh, uh, reserve component, specifically National Guard program I'd highlight in this discussion about strategic land, land power and operations in, the, in human terrain, and that's the State Partnership Program, which uh, when I was at, at U.S. Africa Command was a, and also at U.S. Army Europe, just a hugely powerful tool because it sustains relationships, military to military relationships over time between the, the, uh, the, uh, the forces of a state's National Guard and a particular country. And I think that's something that we can probably learn from and benefit from in the future. I, I just, just want to talk about the point that, that, that I made earlier on, which was the idea of, you know, oh, the NCOs will figure it out. You might think, oh, no, no, no. You know, we were a cracking case back in, back in the UK when we went into Dofar in the early, late 60s, early 70s, yeah. In many ways, we're with a, a communist-inspired um, uh, regime coming out of Yemen, pushing across into, uh, into Oman. Uh, Sultan Qaboos had turned red, got rid of his father and taken position, but what to do? And uh, the then commanding officer of the Special Forces was sitting down, in fact, with two NCOs, you know, having a cup of tea. That's a very British thing. The, uh, that's not cold tea, that's hot tea at the end of the day. <laughs> And uh, uh, looking up on the on the sort of on the battle space that that you know the 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 the, the jebel, and and sort of said you know well wh wh what do we do here? Now the assumption would be that you know here here are here are two guys who you know they've been fighting in Radfan, they've been fighting in Borneo, they've been in Malaya, they've done all that sort of stuff here. They're sitting down there, and over oh, the way America's in fact at the back end of Vietnam. So you've done precision weapons, you've got gunships, you've got a whole range of new technology, new systems, Barrett sniper rifles, you name it. You'd have thought these guys would have turned around and given, oh, well, what we need is a bigger gun. Yeah? They just sit down and they turn around and say, hey, boss, what you need is vets and water. Hmm. Yeah? They absolutely nailed the operational case for turning that insurgency, which was going south, the other way. So the idea that, that you know it doesn't sit outside the officer core or within the sort of what I call the top end of the thinkers of how to deal with this stuff, you know, inductive learning, that sort of experience, really, you know, is just an untruth. Um, I think we got one more quick one, and, and we'll let them let you go run back to the airport. Go <laughs> back to the airport. <laughs> back to interoperability with NATO. What is the right way to? Uh, avoid duplication of efforts and, and pool resources among uh, European countries? And where are the, the niche roles that, that European countries might, might be willing to, to play and to invest in? Yeah, I, I, I would refer to my, my past couple of years working in Africa, and it's not just Europeans. Um, we're at a point now, in previous years, it's been real easy for the United States to say, we're going to go do this. And if, if all the rest of you want to come along for the ride, you're welcome and contribute it, it, as you would like, but, but we got this and we're going to move forward. Those days are now behind us. We, don't, we simply do not have the wherewithal, either in terms of force availability or other resources, not just military, but across the government, to do things ourselves. So in a simple case uh, in Africa where, you know, if we're, we're working a, uh, a training program or something with a with country, uh, other countries, in that with an African country, other countries may have similar interests. Um, and what we've got to find is craft some mechanism that says, okay, let's, for lack of a, of a, of a term, and maybe it's pejorative, but the, the donor nations, if you will, somehow I have to, ha there needs to be some process uh, for those uh, supporting nations to coordinate their efforts. So you don't have four different countries talking to the host nation about, well, buy our helicopter, no, buy our helicopter, no, buy our helicopter. But we can kind of work through this and say, okay, uh, you do helicopters better than we do, and you can probably do that affordably, so why don't you guys take the lead for that? We do small patrol craft pretty well. How about if we, if we take on the maritime domain, and country X, you know, you, you do pretty well with, with the uh, medical training, why don't, you, why don't you take that on? But right now, it, it's, it, it's a haphazard process that the ambassadors of many nations try to work out together, but there's no real structure to it. And I think that's something we can work on in the future. I, I think understanding what they've got and not telling them what they should have, uh, number one. And, and then, you know, take it up another level. You know, because there's lots of countries out there that, 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 that won't have a, you know, top of the range raptor. And in fact, no one can afford a top-of-the-range Raptor. The, um, uh, 
But what they will have is maybe extraordinary influence. They might have intelligence insights which just, you know, are gold dust. You know, they'll have cultural understanding, um, they'll have political, they'll have medical, they'll have a whole range of things here. What we keep on doing is trying to match them up with on the basis of saying, here's the hardware we want, this is how you need to fit into us. The reality is, you know, NATO was fit for purpose at its time, but as we found, as you come out of that, you get into the age of the NRF and all the rest here, what you have is genuine coalitions of the willing. And so therefore you can't guarantee and you can't predispose who's gonna come along. What you've got to do is figure out, right, this is what we've got, and these are the spaces that would make our life more interesting, helpful, and all the rest of you. But the truth is, and then adjust your campaign accordingly, whether you elongate it in time, whether you, but, but not try and have this, like a, this Meccano said, of, of just how things all fit in, in order to maintain a structural approach to defeat of the enemy or overwhelming force or whatever you want to put out there as being this particular answer to a maiden's prayer because it's not. Well, thank you both. I've kept you a little bit over. I apologize, but thank you both so much for coming. I'm, I apologize we didn't get to everyone's questions, um, but it was a great time with both of you, and we really appreciate you coming. Mm. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Brian. Thank you. You need to think this, by the way. Yeah. It's a naughty problem and no one wants to go there. The numbers, numbers, yeah, hard, hard wide numbers. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps. If, if you don't do it, what will happen is stage by stage, step by step, they'll be taken away from you and you will get nothing for it. If you made a bold correction, and just like General Schumacher made when he canceled the Comanche program and kept half the money, you might do yourself an enormous favor. It's not the way we normally think. It's not how people would address the problem. But I'm not sure, and I've got a pretty lucid brain, there's any other way out of the current cul-de-sac you're probably in.